All right, this is our last class of Romans. Um, until next semester, I'm going to do it another semester. <laughs> I don't usually do this. I just, you know, they do one three semesters, but I just think the Lord's got us somewhere, and I think that I want to, I want to stay with what the Lord's saying. <clears throat> All right, uh, if you'll mark your place in Romans 9, but we want to um, um, we want to start out in Exodus chapter 4. So we'll be going to Romans 9, but we're starting in Exodus chapter 4. verse um, 21. Before I read it, I'm just going to read a little bit out of my notes here. It says, to understand the full scope of, of Pharaoh's place, because we're talking about Pharaoh's place in the story of Exodus, <clears throat> we must take note of how God set things up. Long before Moses arrived in Egypt to deliver Israel, God told him to do and to dis demonstrate all the wonders that he would put in his hand by the rod. He also told him that Israel would not be delivered by this means, but that God had a greater means of deliverance that would not require Moses' hand or the rod. In order to reach that means, God would harden Pharaoh's heart so as to not let Israel go from Egypt simply based on supernatural manifestations and wonders. All right, verse 21. This is well before Moses even gets down into Egypt, back to Egypt. <clears throat> and the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, See that thou do all these wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand, but I will harden his heart, that he shall not let the people go. All right, so this is all planned well in advance. This is not something that just kind of happened this way. It is the fact that God knew, he, he knew he's going to send Moses down there. <clears throat> He showed Moses all these wonders to be able to do with, it, with the rod. <clears throat> a lot of times we think the rod's going to do it, you know, the law. <clears throat> and, and, he sh and he told him to go ahead and do all these things. But that God was going to see to it that none of those things done by the rod, by the hand of Moses, were going to bring a, the deliverance that that would come by a slain lamb, okay? Now this is important because we, you know, Moses has always represented the law and we think that by doing certain things that are of God, that that's gonna do it. I mean, you look at Romans 7, and you see this guy that's in the worst possible way. When he wants to do good, he doesn't. And there's all kind of, he's having all kind of problems, and he's a mess. And yet, that's the one that's going to come to a revelation of Christ. That Romans 7 guy. And all the people that, that are doing so well, because they're doing their own works with their own hands, They'll never see Jesus. They'll never see Jesus because, number one, they have no clue of how very not Jesus they are. They don't. Romans 7 is a great teacher. Great teacher. <clears throat> because it really brings you to a place where, oh, wretched man that I am, and this is somebody that's doing his best, and your best is not good enough. Why? Because the Father wants Christ in you, and the Father wants you in Christ, and he wants that to be your stability, which may, you know, which may mean that you have to be a mess for a while.
And it will definitely mean that you'll have to learn the lesson of Romans 7, or there is no Romans 8. All right. So, um, all right, so let's go, go back to Romans 9. I want us to look at Romans 9, verse 17. I guess I should have said keep your place there in Exodus because I was going to sh bring you back, but, but you don't have to. I can always read it for you. Okay, Romans 9 and verse 17. <clears throat> for the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up that I might show my power in thee and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. The scriptures, for the scriptures are talking to Pharaoh. Oh, no, it's not just talking to one guy. It's talking to all of you Pharaohs out there. <laughs> it's talking about all of us that rule our little roost. Can I get amen? Or no me, either one's fine. <clears throat> It is, but the scriptures are talking to him too, all right? Um, and it's saying unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Okay, so my subtitle is why Pharaoh was raised up. The writer of Romans says that the scriptures had something to say to Pharaoh. To this heathen ruler, the scriptures did not speak concerning Jesus being his life, but the scriptures did speak of the cross in a certain manner. They said that God had raised up Pharaoh with a certain purpose in mind. That purpose was that God might show his power, and I, I put in parentheses, in him, in such a manner that God's name would be declared throughout all the earth. These states, statements were not just made in Romans 9.17, but they were also made in Exodus 9.16. All right, so I want you to keep your place here in Romans again. And we're going to go to Romans, I mean to Exodus 9.16. And I'm going to ask you to see if you can see any difference in Exodus 9.16. Okay, am I right or am I wrong here? Let me see. Yeah. And in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up to show in thee my power and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Not, and it's the, if there's a difference, it's not the part that says and in very deed for. Scott? Yeah. But it is, both of them say in thee, that for this cause I've raised thee up to show in thee my power. But here in Exodus, the word in was added by the translators. Okay, I've, I've got this. But in Exodus, when it says the very same words as in Romans, the word in is italicized, which means it was not in the original Hebrew text. In other words, the word in was added by the translators and should simply read like this, I raise thee up to show thee my power. Now we know from 1 Corinthians that the power and wisdom of God is displayed in the weakness of the cross. There, God boasts that he, he in weakness is stronger than men. This coincides with the fact that God would not allow the deliverance of his people from Egypt to come through any other means than through a weak and slaughtered man, a lamb. And that's because if God's going to show his power, it's going to come through lamb power. Because the New Testament declares that that is what's going to happen. But the lamb is not going to come in Pharaoh. 
he is going to be confronted. Uh, where is I probably had that too. He's going to be confronted having all of the power and might of Egypt. He's going to be confronted with a slaughtered lamb that brings his whole thing down. All right. So, subtitle, A Picture of Christ Crucified. Um, but even beyond this, and so now we get more into the real purpose of God. <clears throat> but even beyond this, we discover that the whole scenario in bringing Israel out of the bondage of Egypt was nothing more than a picture of Christ crucified, Christ, God's crucified son. We get this from Exodus 4, 21. So let's go back. Exodus, where we were originally at. We'll read verse 21 again, but then we're going to read a couple of them after that. <clears throat> Exodus 4, 21. And the Lord said unto Moses, When thou goest to return into Egypt, see that thou do all those wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thine hand, but I will harden his heart that he shall not let the people go. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. He said, I'm not going to deliver the people that you're going down there for by your hand with all of your things that you got. And I want you to say to Pharaoh, this isn't about Israel. This is about my son, my firstborn. Now this is before all of the Passover thing is even set up. Do you know it hadn't been set up yet? Do you realize that? It hadn't even been set up. That's chapter 12 and 13. This is before he's even gone down into there. And God is saying, this is not an issue of my people or Pharaoh or his might or what you're going to do by miracles or this and that. This is an issue of my firstborn. Okay? Next verse. Verse 23. And I say unto thee, let my son go that he may serve me. If thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. This is the first mention of that. And God is screaming out to the Pharaohs that are not letting Christ sit on the lamb, let my son go out of you. Let him come forth out of you. Uh, which is in line with what, what the first few verses said where Paul is letting his son, the lamb, go out of him, and it's in perfect line and of one accord with uh, Romans 8 and all that it set up. This thing, this thing has marched from the first verse of Romans 1 right down to now, and he's still trying to say, look, everything I did with these other people, it's about letting my son go. Let him come forth. Don't hold him back anymore. You, you know, you have that which is my son in you, but you have him in bondage. Let him go, you Pharaoh. <laughs> you can hear it in God's tone, folks. You can hear it in that tone. He's serious, and all this other stuff has been fine. You know, well, he will show mercy to whom he will show mercy, and da da da. This is fine. It's okay, but this is not okay anymore. This is the the original intention was to get my son out of you, and if I don't get my son son out of you, you're going to turn right around and continue to persecute my son Israel in their promised land, which Pharaoh did do except the few times that Israel said, let's go to Pharaoh and get him on our side. It's an abomination. And Jeremiah said it was. 
Say not in your heart, we will go down to Pharaoh, and because he hath chariots, and da-da-da-da, and he will spread himself. That's the very thing that he tried to show that that's not his way. Number one, by Moses and all of the supernatural power, and number three, two, by Pharaoh and all of the might of, of Egypt, and all of the weapons, and all of the strength, and all of the chariots. So for them to way down here to go back to Egypt, he's just saying, you're not going to let my son go. You're going to live according to your knowledge and your mind, and you're going to keep him bound up, and you're going you're to use whatever you got for yourself and to get your way and to, to control things and to keep things in a certain way. And you get upset when things aren't in control. And, you know, I, how am I supposed to deal with this stuff? And, you know, and, you, and maybe I need to do this or I'll make this move. And it's a chess game with God instead of knock things off and just say you win. I can't do it. I am a mess. Oh, wretched man. Folks, oh, wretched man that I am is more than I'm a mess. I'm a mess is a, means you're not there yet. <laughs> you, know, you need more Romans 7. Well, he'll keep doing that because he cares. He will, I'm telling you, there's, there's stuff in here that he will, he will make it so hard until he cracks that nut. Because what comes out of it? Christ the seed. Out of your death. Out of Abraham's death, dead body, and Sarah's dead body comes the seed. It's the faith Hallelujah. that we all claim we follow. The faith. That's the faith. Anyway, save that for another day. <clears throat> God viewed Israel's hardships in Egypt as if it were his son's crucifixion. Wow. That we're crucifying Christ. And he, he deals with that in Hebrews. When he says, you crucify fresh the son of God. You're keeping him on the cross and not letting that crucified nature live through you. Just keep pointing away. Pointing away to him instead of letting that crucified one manifest himself. <clears throat> Israel may have been brought out with a mighty deliverance, but in God's mind it was a picture of his son and those in him being brought out of death and un unto resurrection. The key to both of these scenarios, the Passover and the cross, was the death of the lamb. When referring to Israel in Egypt, God called him his son, his firstborn. I want, what is, oh, I have it next. We know from Romans 8, 29, which says that he was the firstborn to be the, well, let's read it or let me read it. Romans 8, 29, this is right after called, at, according to his birth, for whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. How many of you agree with that? To be conformed to the image of his son. That's not all that verse. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Okay. The firstborn here represents the prototype. I've mentioned that before. It's not just the first in order or the first in number. You're, oh, you're the first... You're the firstborn, so, you know, but he's supposed to be the prototype of what we all conform to. That's why it is conformed to the image of the prototype, the firstborn, the one in whom it dwells, to whom all inheritance belongs, to him. Did you know that? But we are joined heirs with him. We're joined in his life and his nature, and we're joined in his sufferings. I mean, what kind of wife would it be if she says, oh, I want to be with you with your riches. You know, she marries a rich guy or something like that. I want to be with you with your riches, which Deb never had to worry about with me. But, you know, but I don't want, you know, I don't want to have to go through trials with you. 
You know, I wouldn't want it to be hard. <laughs> well, it's intentionally hard. Because God wants to get the first more. He wants you, Pharaoh, to let his son go. That's what he's after. And he's not playing around. He's, he's kind and he's merciful and everything else. But once he starts really manifesting his mercy, you're probably going to go through Romans 7. You're going into captivity. Being brought into captivity to my mind and to this situation. Remember Romans 7 talked about the captivity. It is the captivity. It is separated from the life of God. That's what it says in Ephesians. You who, you know, know the Lord, but you've been separated from the life of God. <clears throat> so what was the power God wanted made known? The power God wanted to show two things. To Pharaoh was the power of the Lamb. The power that he wanted to show through Pharaoh was all the force and might of Egypt along with its inability to withstand the power of God demonstrated by a slaughtered lamb. He wanted Romans 7 to be a victory. What kind of victory? I lose. I can't win in myself. I, I'm a wretched person. I'm looking for a who. Immediately after, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in union with Christ. Because they're going to bring forth his fruit. And his life is going to course through their veins. And it doesn't always look like, because Romans 7 didn't look like that was the, the perfect candidate, the most, the most glorious candidate for Romans 8 is you. And he'd go, what? I'm the worst. I'm the less than the least of all. Ah, you're on the right track, aren't you there? <laughs> it's God's ways are not our ways. He doesn't think like us, and he doesn't want us to, to, to try to figure him out. He wants the mind of Christ in us. And that's not figuring him out or figuring the scriptures out. Why harden Pharaoh's heart? God did not harden Pharaoh's heart merely to show that he can do with people however he pleases regardless of their will. In general, he's just not that way. He'd really, he gave us free will. He'd like for us to choose him. He hardened his heart to show forth the greatness of his son demonstrated in weakness. When it says that God wanted to demonstrate his power, he meant that it would, be, it would be accomplished by means of a lamb. He's going to demonstrate his power. He kills his own son. And we freak out at that, and they're just going, remember, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? Or, who, who is it that condemned you, the one who died? Nay, rather, he's going, no, don't condemn this. I'm for it. I was all for it. It's our nature. It's who we are. We live this way. We live to give ourselves in this way. I will now give myself in prayer and intercession for you all the days that you exist. I'm for this way. Now be with me. That's Romans 8. He's begging, you know. Well, I don't know. Sucking our thumbs. You know, I shall nakedness or peril or, you know, does that mean God doesn't love me anymore? I don't get it. He's going, are you listening? All right, go back to Romans 7. <laughs> no, but maybe. But maybe. Because you don't realize how wretched you are as long as you're trying to See, it's like you're still trying to be with God instead of be one with him. It's like, oh, am I with you? I just need you to tell me that I am. And he'd go, shut up. No, not really. 
<laughs> Shut up. No, he, he continually pours back into us. But at some juncture, people, we've got to say, you know, Jesus, I, I don't want to hear I'm one with you anymore. I'm going to just live that way. I don't even want to hear the teaching anymore. That's me. I'm one. We're together. You're it. I'm not. I had a good rhyming thing, but it yeah, we probably wouldn't have gone over so well. But it really would have got the point. <laughs> All right, where was I here? Um, God held Pharaoh back from bringing about deliverance through means that did not truly demonstrate the power that he wanted known throughout the earth. In other words, none of the miracles of Moses' hand by the rod would he allow, even though in the natural he probably would have let them go, it would have gone totally contrary to everything he is and says. So he says, you're already not with me, Pharaoh. I'm trying to get you to let my people go, and you're insisting on being the ruler. Hello? <laughs> I hear you breathing. I know you're out there. <laughs> In God's mind, Pharaoh represented world power, while the slain lamb represented God power. Therefore, all the world has been divided into two categories, those in Adam and those in Christ. We are found either to be among those who share with Jesus in his death and crucified suffering or among those who do, do the crucifying because they have the power to do so. However, ultimately, everything will serve the purposes of God in one manner or another. Either it will be the force that rallies against and crucifies his son, or it will be the vessels that choose the lamb as their source. All the earth praises the Lord, not because they're right, because he says, what, what is it, Acts, just first chapter maybe, where he says, you know, that you with wicked hands crucified him, but this was the determinant counsel of God. It doesn't excuse our motives but it all is gonna end up glorifying because they can rally all they want to crucify and to put Jesus away and he just rises out of it every time. I mean, he's down for a while, but that's only, that's part of it. And then he comes back because if it's really Jesus, regardless of how flaky your vessel is, if it's really Jesus, nobody can do anything against him Ultimately, they cannot. He will come back. <laughs> I rest my case. <clears throat> All right. Where are we? Not too bad. Thank you, Lord. All right. Fellowship in his sufferings. Because this is the... This is the ultimate end of it. Fellowship in his sufferings. This is, this is where we have truly got it. Because human nature doesn't want that, right? Human nature resists that, and that's this. This is the failsafe. You know, you know what a failsafe is, don't you? It is absolute that it can't go wrong, because God, when He brings us to fellowship in His suffering, He's either going to find one or two three things. He's going to find the Lamb in us, or He's going to find human nature. And so he brings us into this, and he sees our reactions. And it's okay. You know, see, we go, oh, my God, I don't want to fail or whatever. If, you're, if you haven't wanted back over here, you know, wanted to be conformed to the image of his son and worked on it up to this point, then it's going to happen. Human nature is going to be human nature. It can't help but be human nature. You, me, anybody, this is, there's no respecter of persons in this, Jew, Gentile, Male, female, it doesn't matter. It's an issue of the heart. And when the heart turns to the Lord, the veil is rent, and then we're changed. And when the heart doesn't turn to the Lord, you can say, well, that Randy doesn't teach right, or he, he, he's weird, you know, when he says stuff. And how can I ever get any of this from somebody like that? 
you know, there are, there are worse people than me. There's at least three that I know of on the planet. It's, it's, I'm telling you, it's not based on me or your parents or your this or that. It's based on your heart. And you say, well, you know, why is so-and-so seeing Jesus and I'm not? Well, you figure it out, Skippy. <laughs> All right, fellowship in his sufferings. <coughs> Some people wonder why <coughs> the whole affair of Israel's deliverance from Egypt was less than ideal. Now, <coughs> a lot of people really do look at it as if it was, <coughs> they look at it through rose-colored glasses. They say, <coughs> okay, Israel is down in bondage for 400 years, but Moses comes down and he does some really cool stuff, and then the lamb dies, and and then you know they go, hey, let's all go to the promised land, <laughs> you know, and you know, and then there's that incident there at the Red Sea, but then it opens up and they go over and they just like, you know, this was just great. <clears throat> this thing was an ordeal for for anybody that's looking for deliverance. This thing was not smooth at all. <laughs> all right, let me give you my, my reasoning behind it. <clears throat> not only did God not use some glorious wonder to bring about his end, but he didn't bring it about with a, de a definitive victory. A definitive victory. Think about it. I mean, we'll, I'll get in here. <clears throat> what I am referring to is the fact that the lamb died for them, but he didn't die for the Egyptians, therefore the Egyptians still had murder in their hearts. And they're still in Egypt. Okay, if you're there, put yourself in that situation, okay? And you're going, oh, cool, the lamb died. My, my firstborn didn't die. But there's like 50 people banging at your door whose firstborn did die, and they're Egyptians. And even if they're not banging at your door, you know that they could any minute. That's why you're dressed and ready to go. <clears throat> Instead of Israel leaving in a victory parade, they had to dress and move with haste to get out of there because the imminent wrath of the Egyptians was about to happen. Right? I mean, we, we think, oh, the Lamb just did it all, and everything's good, and now we're the special chosen people, and now we're just going to walk down the streets, and they're going to go, you're the chosen people. <laughs> you you're all are special. You know, they're going, no, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> uh, instead of Israel leaving in a victory parade, <laughs> And in their stressful and fearful state while fleeing, God allowed Pharaoh's armies to come upon them. You know what I mean? It, and you go, you go, yeah, but the cloud came down and held them back for a while. Why not hold them back in, in Memphis or whatever the city was that they came out of, you know? Why not hold them back there? so that there's no fear. So they're just going, oh, let's go, you know, and oh, we have time, you know, let's go. Hey, you know, <laughs> this, this smooth, everything. This, oh, this is deliverance. This is God's deliverance. This is the way he does it. I like God. <clears throat> no, he lets them get right on top of them, stops them right there where they can see them. They're going, hurry, get across. <laughs> I mean, I mean, think about it. Let's see, how did I write this? <clears throat> um, Israel was trapped between Pharaoh's armies, the mountains, and the Red Sea. All of this only added to their anxiety. <clears throat> we think that Jesus should deliver us, make it easy to leave Egypt so that we can give him glory by a great testimony of deliverance. We get to the other side and go, man, you wouldn't believe what God did for us. It was smooth like butter. I'm telling you, this was, this was, God just was incredible. 
And yes, they did sing on the other side. Probably, you know, sometimes you just sing or you make jokes because you're, it's comic relief or something, you know. And like, you know, but this thing was stressful to the end until they saw Pharaoh and those guys dead. Okay? <clears throat> so we think that Jesus should deliver us, make it easy to leave Egypt so that we can give him glory by a great testimony of deliverance. But instead, he not the devil, hardens Pharaoh's heart, sends him chasing after us, and makes what should have been a victory rally into a crisis for their very lives. <sighs> Just, what is the deal? I thought this lamb thing was gonna be, you know, smooth. Our problem is that we know all about deliverance, but we don't know about deliverance by Christ crucified. We do know all about deliverance, folks, but we don't know that much yet about deliverance by Christ crucified. <clears throat> and we do not know about fellowshipping with Jesus and his sufferings because, or the proof of that, is that we don't even know how to take average everyday trials and turn them in to opportunities for Christ crucified. We don't know. We know some, if we're in really spiritual mood <laughs> at the moment, we do pretty good. But at other times it's like, this, is, this, is, this stuff going on right now is nothing but a hindrance to me in the Lord. No, it's not it's supposed to be. It's not, by the way, it's not hindering you and the Lord, it's hindering your flesh, you know? Well, yeah, but I'm, I'm trying to minister for God. I'm, I'm trying to do God's work. I want to do things for God, and this is, you know? I mean, I've told you the story. When I was in Bible school, <clears throat> the Bible school I was in, the people that ran it were insane. We're not insane. We're crazy, but we're not insane. <clears throat> Those people, they preached constantly, get in the word, search the scriptures, get in the word, but they never gave you any time to do it. And then when class was out, there would be all these things that you'd have to do, not just your chores, that was regular stuff. There was, all, you know, you had to dig ditches and paint buildings and, you know, it was all this massive stuff that was always going on and everything. And you'd come back to your room and it'd be late. Yeah, and you come back to the room and, you, you know, you'd be tired and, you know, you'd start trying to get in the scriptures. And this happened to me more times than I can tell you. Somebody would see my light on and come and say, hey, we need somebody to help us uh, do the dishes late. Well, you know, we got kind of late on everything. And I'm going, look, I'm a Bible school student. I'm trying to get in the word here. I need to see Jesus. That's why I'm here. And they go, get up and come help us do the dishes. And I go, this ain't the Lord, and these people aren't of God, and this can't, there's, you know, all these people, they're sin of the devil. Now, I mean, I said stuff like, they're, they're literally of the devil because they're keeping me out of the word, and all I want to do is be with my Jesus, and they're keeping me from Jesus. Until one day I realized, I'm keeping me from Jesus. I'm keeping me from laying down my life and saying, and I told the Lord, I said, look, <clears throat> I started seeing the lamb and I said, look, <clears throat> I'm going to start giving myself to others. And if this comes up, if this comes up, I'm going to give myself to others. <clears throat> no, it was before that the Lord said to me, if you will do that, that's right. He said, if you will, if you will give yourself to others, even if I give you five minutes, your time in the word will be incredible. That's what he told me. He didn't lie, folks. He didn't lie. He didn't lie. It's still good. What I thought was, was the devil was God. What I thought was keeping me from the Lord was actually an opportunity to really not just give Christ through me, but actually to come back and then he would say, you know, give and it shall be given. You gave the life. I'm going to fill you up on the life through here and here. Drink, 
drink of the living waters. And I just didn't have all that much time, but it would just fill me up and just, I'm ready to go pour out again, you know. But it's like when you're going, no, 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 I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay here and drink. Don't make me pour out. You get nothing. There's no life. There's no living water. It's just, I'm doing my duty, searching the scriptures. Anyway, I didn't mean to get off on all that. But. <clears throat> Why would God proceed in such a lackluster way concerning the biggest deliverance Israel would ever have? A story that would be told unto all generations of Israelite children. Why would God only make things worse by hardening Pharaoh's heart? Do you remember some of the results of that? Do you remember that he hardened his heart and then he started just making it harder on the children of Israel and they went to Moses and said, look, you're making this worse, stop. Last paragraph. It's a big one though. Let's see, let me see how far it goes. I'm kidding, I'm at the bottom of the page and I'm just doing that. It looked like, whoa! <laughs> God hardened Pharaoh's heart in order to make it as bad as it can be. Remember, to God, this story is not primarily about Israel, but about how he delivers his son. As with the case at, at Jesus' trial and crucifixion, all was turned against him. The enemy's heart was set to use all available power and brute force to destroy God's son. During that fiasco, all is made much worse than it should be, right? Look at the trial. I mean, that's like, this. how how did it get to this point? <clears throat> um, but it is in this that God shows his love. At the cross, Jesus suffered every torment that man can experience. Why? So that in him, we could see the victory that would be ours over every torment we could ever face in the lamb, in the cross, in, the, in this spirit, in this spirit. You know, I remember who was it, Charlemagne or whatever, that when the when the Moors, the the Arabs were taking over Jerusalem and everything, and and the Pope and them wanted to send troops and drive them out of Jerusalem and retake it, <clears throat> and uh, I think it was Charlemagne saw a vision, and it was a vision of the cross, and he said, in in this symbol, conquer something like that. Anybody know exactly what it's, it's basically that in this symbol? And it was a, it was the cross, and so they put the cross and all that. But it didn't mean just in that symbol, but it's in that spirit. It was in that spirit, conquer. And that spirit, that cross, first and always first, must conquer us, or we're just conquerors, not more than conquerors. We're just conquerors, just conquering whatever gets in our way. <clears throat> At the cross, Jesus suffered every torment that man can experience. Why? So that in him we could see the victory that would be ours over every torment we could ever face. Our means of victory, the lamb nature, and obviously oneness with him in that. In this, we share in the sufferings of Christ and manifest the nature of Christ crucified. All right, well, that's not the end. We've got a whole nother semester with this stuff. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus, and 
we really don't want you to quit your dealing with us. Whether, it, whether it's Romans going on or not is not the real issue. The issue is, Lord, we want to, we don't want to get up and, and get comfortable and then go back to our comfortable ways and then pretty soon lose that heart and that spirit and that, that, that churning within us that, we, that says, I must have Jesus. <clears throat> So, Father, don't let us up and don't let us stop. And thank you for the teachers, not just me. Thank you for the other teachers. Thank you for the word that comes out of their mouths that is confirming. And we're all confirming one to another, even though we don't even know what the other teachers are saying. We know in the spirit that this is you, not us. We know that your plan is to bring all of us, not just the Bible school students, not just the ones in this room or the ones that are part of this church, but, Lord, those that are on screen Skype and others, Lord, that are partakers of your spirit. Lord, the thing that you're doing in Ireland, the thing that you're doing in Arizona, Father, you are doing it in Arizona too. You have, you have brought them to a death so that they could come into new life. And Lord, they're embracing it. And they're speaking the same things we're speaking without even knowing what's going on because we are one and because your hand is upon us and your hand is upon us to, to, to do a work and to cut it short in righteousness and to bring forth your son in a certain way in this body, in his body, not this body, his body, us. Lord, we cry out, give us more. Yes. To Put more on the fire, just, just like the three Hebrew children. Seven times hotter than it's ever been. Because if Jesus is with us and in us, he'll walk around in it with, with us, and we'll walk around in it with him. And it'll be not even the smell of smoke will be upon us when we come out. Because to us, it's not suffering. It's being with Jesus. And our heart is not just we're not embracing just suffering we're embracing you jesus we love you we do love you and we are after you and our hearts are crying out we say please holy spirit please holy spirit please don't let us up don't let us go back don't let us go back oh do your work while we're in captivity and bring us out so that we'll love burnt stones. We'll love pulled down walls. We'll see what is truly real about that instead of a glorious temple that we glory in and make, it, make us feel religious and spiritual. We will find the beauty of the lamb, the crucified himself. We will love you, Jesus. We will hug those stones and we will kiss them. We will Kiss your nail-scarred hands, Jesus. You're everything to us. And we want you to manifest by your nature and life in us, through us, to others. Like Paul crying out, even to be willing to be a curse from you, Jesus, for their sake. Put that kind of spirit in us. Father, we thank you that you have begun a good work. We believe you'll finish it, but we believe that our will must be attuned to you and say yes, Lord, to you. Our will must say yes. We can't do it. Our, we can't do it by our will, but our will can say yes to you because you're what needs to be done. We need to find oneness with you that is so real that there's no difference between us and you because you dwell in us just as you dwelt in your own body on this earth. Lord, some are further along in their heart in this thing. Some are a little behind. Help each and every one of us to know that we're all together, one flock, that, that a flock is not every sheep walking in the same point at the same time stacked up on one another, but many gathered around together, all moving with their shepherd, you, Jesus. And if some are a little further behind, they're coming, they're following you, Jesus, and they want you and their desires with you. 
Help them not to look at the sheep in front of them, but to look at you, Jesus, and to say, I'm not giving up, I'm not giving up, I'm following you, Jesus, and I will find you, and, and I'll be closer to you before this is all over with, because you want it to be, not because I can will it into existence, because it's your desire and your heart. So, Father, I just cover this flock, I know here in very short time some will be going off to Arkansas after that some will be going off to Ireland Lord we are one flock and if we're in different locations we're one flock Jesus you said to us to fear not little flock because it's the father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom and we believe you Jesus and, Lord, for those who can't believe the things, they're just not there yet, Lord, give them, Lord, give them faith to trust me, even me. If they can't even trust you right now, to trust what they can see of me, a shepherd, that I'm telling them they're going to make it just to keep their eyes on Jesus. And, Father, I know you're guiding me, Jesus. I know you're in me and leading this flock. So, Lord, let confidence come into them and let us hold on to one another. Let your life flow out of me so that they gain more and more confidence. That fears are overcome. Fear not, little flock. Fears are overcome. And they begin to walk in faith or they begin to walk in my faith because I believe that you're going to bring us all till we all come. And they can trust me. They believe I know you. And they believe they can trust that I'm not lying to them, that I'm hearing from you. Give them confidence from that until they can just hear your voice so clearly, until they can just fully be with you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for caring for each and every one of us. We love you. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Father. We love you, Holy Spirit. And we thank you, our dear, precious God. In Jesus' name, amen.